Hey, Two Rivers family, good morning. Welcome to an opportunity for us to taste and see that the Lord is good. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, I'm here with my friend Miranda and Jeremy, Connor, and Andrew. By the way, this, this brother right here got engaged this week, so we're celebrating that. There's a glow. There's a glow. Pat's on the slides. We have Wyatt behind the camera. We're glad to uh, offer some space for us to be encouraged and strengthened in the Lord. Uh, let's worship the Lord with joy together.
nothing The king of all kings came to serve Watch my feet Covering me with your love If more of you means less of me Take everything Yes, all
carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, all I know is I need you, I'll run to the Father, fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, the reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again. saw my condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand, I can't comprehend, all I know is I need you, so I run to the Father, fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again.
would now open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 13 to 17 today as we continue uh, our slow journey through the gospel of Mark. I've entitled uh, the message today, The Way and the Truth. I want to remind you uh, as you're opening your Bibles up and and finding your place, uh, it's Holy Week. Uh, Every passage that we come to now is getting closer and closer to Good Friday and the resurrection of Jesus. And every day Jesus has been coming to the temple and he's teaching and he is acting in defiance of the temple's exclusivity and the walls of separation uh, that are keeping people, specifically women and Gentiles, on the outside. Uh, the, The opposition of Jesus's actions and his teaching is a growing of the power elite of the temple. Uh, the chief priests and the uh, teachers of the law are have now uh, recruited, they've gone out and they've recruited um, Pharisees and they've recruited Herodians uh, into the mix of the opposition to Jesus and his teaching and his leading to this new way of radical inclusivity in the gospel. Who are the Pharisees? We'll see them in the passage today. The Pharisees uh, are distinguished by a very strict Uh, observance to both the written Mosaic law, but also uh, traditions, oral traditions. So they are a group of people that have really even raised the the written Mosaic law even higher of their own traditions, and they are uh, simply religious oppressors of people. The chief priests and the teachers of law also recruit a group of people called the Herodians, in their opposition to Jesus. Who are the Herodians? Uh, They derive their name uh, as followers of King Herod. This is a a political party who wanted Judea, the region where Jerusalem is, uh, as well as other areas around to be ruled by the Herods. Uh, They are simply the political oppressors of people. So now we have the chief priests and we have the teachers of the law and we have the Pharisees who are religious oppressors and we have the political oppressors, the Herodians, all coming together in their opposition to Jesus. They are the power elite of Jerusalem of the day and power is addictive. And when someone is coming against their power structures of oppression and walls and separation, they don't like it very much. And so they come together in opposition of Jesus. It's interesting in our text to note that the Herodians and the Pharisees are coming together against Jesus because they weren't together. Herodians were political foes of Pharisees. Herodians wanted the rule of the Herods, but the Pharisees wanted to restore uh, Israel to the kingdom of David. And so they were... They were political foes coming together against Jesus. They're in a power struggle uh, with each other, but they were united in their disdain for Jesus, who was again out to upset and turn over all of the structures of oppression uh, in the gospel and inviting anyone and everyone to have life, full life, restored life, abundant life in Jesus. Um, I want to remind us of something that we talked um, uh, quite a bit about last week uh, in our time together in Mark 12, the beginning of Mark 12. Jesus is the freedom fighter for all people. And his fight for freedom, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 56, is for all nations, all tribes, all peoples. And this is upsetting the power establishments of the day. And so with that context in mind, let's come to the passage. Uh, I'll just read it. I'm reading out of the ESV translation. Let's read these verses together again. Mark 12, verses 13 to 17. And they sent... To him, to Jesus, they, chief priests, elders, teachers of the law, they sent him to Jesus, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, to trap Jesus in his talk, in his teaching there at the temple. 
And they came to him and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and you do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Yes or no question. They come to Jesus and they're asking him a yes or no question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Verse 15, but knowing their hypocrisy, knowing their hypocrisy of the question and the trap that the question is, Jesus said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius. A denarius was a coin that was equal to one day's of a, a wage for labor. So one denarius is one day's wage for a day's work. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, they being the Herodians and the Pharisees, they gave, they brought Jesus this Roman coin called a denarius. And they brought one and Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render or give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Once again, a, a direct question. Uh, they are not seeking truth. They are not seeking the way and the truth. They're out to test Jesus. We've seen this the last two weeks. Uh, a question like that, Jesus answered a question with a question. Jesus answered a question with a parable. Again, today, Jesus is answering a, a loaded, hypocritical uh, question out to test him with another question. Uh, quite shrewd of Jesus to continue to interact in these ways. Um, let me give you some historical context for just a minute. Uh, these interrogators, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they, they bait the trap by asking a yes or no question about an explosive political and religious issue of the day. And the explosive issue of the day was the paying of taxes to Rome, who was oppressing the people of Judea. Uh, Judea became a Roman province in AD 6, which simply means they were overthrown by Rome in AD 6. A census was taken. And the Romans levied what was called a head tax on all the people. And everybody had to pay the head tax. And so in addition to paying property taxes or other taxes for articles, which we would know as sales taxes, they are also all taxed based on each individual person. And I just want to invite you to imagine, can you imagine for a moment, it's your land and it gets overthrown by this oppressive Roman government. And then you have to pay that oppressive government taxes to be there in your country living on your land. How would that make you feel? The NIV application commentary as I was studying this this week uh, points this out. This is really important historical context for us to understand almost every resident of Palestine knew someone whom the Romans had victimized. They were sold into slavery, they were forced off their land, and they and some were executed for rising up against the oppression. So here's what's going on here. These two oppressors who are coming together in unison against Jesus come to Jesus and they say to him, you need to pick a side here. The question is loaded because it, it, it raises the question of Jesus's allegiance. Can one pay taxes to Caesar and still give allegiance to the God of Israel? And so Pharisees, Herodians, political foes come together with this loaded question and they ask Jesus basically, which side are you going to be on here? The Pharisees or the Herodians? There's no middle ground. The Herodians would say, 
pay the tax. If you say pay the tax, then you're one of us. And the Pharisees would say, well, don't pay the tax and stand with us against Roman oppression. And that's where the hypocrisy of this whole thing was with the Pharisees. And so Jesus knows the hypocrisy and he says, basically, do you have a coin? Do you have a denarius? Bring one to me. And so they bring this coin over to Jesus. He asked for the coin, which, which is their coin. It's the Herodians coin. It's their, it's they, they have both, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they've both submitted to doing business with this Roman currency. And they have both, hear this, they have both benefited financially from the Roman occupation. That's the hypocrisy of what's going on with the Pharisees. They are actually benefiting. And the Herodians are benefiting from the Roman occupation. And that's the hypocrisy of the question. Uh, maybe to help you understand this uh, um, in our context today, um, uh, in the context of the, of the explosive and hard and difficult and important and necessary conversation on race, uh, he is using the question, do you have a denarius? Do you bring me a denarius? He is using the question to point out their hypocrisy because they are both benefiting from the evil system that is at play without taking a side in their debate because the debate that they're having is one of their own uh, oppression. It's one of their own uh, wealth uh, in terms of how they are benefiting from it. And so Jesus asked the question uh, to help them understand their hypocrisy. I want to pause here for just a second and just have you think through this question with me. Do you think that Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, who grew up in Nazareth, do you think that he might have an opinion about the Roman-empowered Herods? Remember what happened when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was the current Herod's granddad. That's, that's what was happening when Jesus was... So the current Herod in our text today, Matthew, or Mark 13, his granddad... And um, at the beginning of uh, the life of Jesus. Remember the story. Herod the Great, wise men from the east came looking for the newborn king of the Jews. And the Herod kills all of the male children two years and younger in Bethlehem. And because Joseph had been warned by an angel in a dream, Jesus was taken to Egypt. He was a refugee in a foreign land to escape the oppression of an evil leader. And it wasn't until that Herod the Great died that Joseph and Mary brought Jesus out of Egypt and raised him in the town of Nazareth. So, so do you think Jesus may have some feelings about Herod? I, I, know, I know I would. Um, this person harmed me, harmed my people. Uh, I'd like to go after him now. But Jesus doesn't pick a side here. He doesn't pick the side against Rome, against the Herods, against the Pharisees. He doesn't pick a side because both of them are oppressors. I'm not going to pick either side. One of you is a religious oppressor. One of you is a political oppressor. I'm not on the side of oppressing. I'm not picking either one of your sides. He knows it's a trap. He knows their hypocrisy. And so he does something very shrewd here. He sets a trap of his own. The king of kings and the lord of lords asked to borrow a coin. Just think about that for a second. The lord of glory who created everything asked to borrow a coin called a denarius. And he asked the question, whose likeness and image is on this cone? And they answered, Caesar's. And then Jesus says, well, render or give back to Caesar what belongs to him. And render to God the things that are God's. Now remember at this moment when Jesus says this statement, they are at the temple. They are in, they're on Mount Zion in the temple. And what does it say 
about who brought the coin out. It says they brought the coin. Who is they? They is the Pharisees and the Herodians. It says they. So to the Herodians, Jesus says, yes, Caesar, his own coins belong to him. He can have his own coins. They had better pay the taxes. And to the Pharisees, Jesus exposes that they have no qualms about bringing an image of Caesar and his evil and his oppression and his belief that he was deity into the holy temple grounds. The exposure of their hypocrisy is remarkable that a Pharisee could bring him a coin of Caesar who believes himself to be a deity himself in the very place of God's holy temple. So in effect, Jesus says, let Caesar have his idols and give to God what belongs to God. Uh, Herodians and Pharisees were about behavior, about um, ruling by fear and power and control and behavior, uh, oppressing people in fear so they could control them. But Jesus is about our hearts. He's about what happens on our inside. And so I think the question for us to consider here is whose image is inscribed on our hearts. We have an image of Caesar on the outside, on a coin, on something material. The real question is not whose image is ascribed on a coin. The real question is whose image and likeness is in my very heart. And God's image and God's likeness has been given to every single person that God has created. In the image of God, He created us in His likeness. All people, all nations, all races, all tribes created in the very image and likeness of God. This is a beautiful diversity that reflects the unity and the diversity of the Godhead. The creation reflects the diversity and the plurality of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the question isn't who gets your taxes. The question is who gets you, who gets your heart. That's the real question. Whose image is in you? They are saying the oppressors, those in, that are coming together in opposition of Jesus in this radical way of grace, they are saying you must pick a side or you must pick a tribe. The Herodians tribe says that you have to be submissive to this oppressive government. The Pharisees tribe says uh, you, you have to submit to our rules and our authority and our power and our fear. And Jesus is saying here, uh, I'm not picking either one of your sides. I'm not picking this oppressive tribe who's oppressing politically or this oppressive tribe who is oppressing religiously. That's not who Jesus is. That's not the way of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the Good Shepherd who is Jesus, the Son of God. Revelation 5.5 5 says, I am the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is saying here, I'm not picking one of your tribes. I am the tribe. We see this in verse 14. They were uh, actually speaking something true of Jesus in their attempt to try to uh, trap him. And they say, you truly teach the way of God, the truth, the way. Yes, it, that is absolutely true. This is true. He is the way and the truth and the life. This is true. Jesus is way bigger than either one of those two tribes. He truly teaches the way of God because he is the truth and the way. So I wonder as we read through that passage, did John chapter 14 ring a bell? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus isn't to be fit into our overtly religious or our overtly political identities. Jesus is not offering to be an add-on to our lives. 
He is the way. He is the freedom fighter. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus alone. This is the gospel. The truth of Jesus is liberating to all captives. But also we know this to be true. The truth of John 14, 6, that truth can offend, can't it? He tells the disciples uh, very, very soon after this encounter that we're looking at today in Mark 12, very soon after this encounter, he is with all of his disciples. It is The Thursday night before Good Friday, this is John chapter 15. This is the Last Supper discourse. And Jesus tells the disciples, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. That's what was happening. They they pick a side and then we will love you as because you have picked one of our sides. Jesus isn't picking either one of their sides. The world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but because you are of the line of the tribe of Judah, because I chose you out of the world, out of those oppressive tribes, therefore the world hates you. But in in the reality of knowing that followers of Jesus who are following the line of the tribe of Judah will face opposition even hatred for those who want to oppress and those who demand that we pick one of their sides in the the very same last supper context jesus says even though the world hates you you are called to love this is from john chapter 13 just as i have loved you you are to love one another this is how people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I'm not going to pick either of your tribes. I am the way and the truth and the life, and the way is love and grace and freedom and liberty and hope and peace. And so to the Herodians, Jesus, you can die on this hill of this tax. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. To the Pharisees, you can die on the hill of your morals and your traditions. But I, I will die on the hill of Golgotha so that all these other hills and places of division and walls and divisions and oppressions will be made level. I am bringing down all of the dividing walls. Be reminded again, Jesus borrowed a coin. He was the king, the king of the world, and Jesus didn't have his own coin. He was rich, but he became poor so that we might become rich in Jesus. This is the proclamation of the gospel. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty, so that, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is what it looks like, I believe, church, to advocate and to ally and to maintain justice and do what is right, Isaiah 56, 1, for the sake of those who are captive, for the sake of those who are silenced, for the sake of those who are minimized and oppressed. As we follow Jesus, we become more like Jesus and we ally and we advocate and we, we are part of the mission of setting captives free. The world... The world that we are living in in today's culture and the political world and the religious world is screaming at us like the Herodians and the Pharisees in this passage to Jesus. They are screaming at us, you must pick a side, pick a side. You got to go this way or you got to go that way, but you must pick a side. And I would say to us, this morning, uh, don't go either of those sides. Instead of going this way or that way, I would say to us, let's go deeper in Jesus. 
We are the Jesus tribe. We are the Jesus people. And the truth of the matter is by following in the way of Jesus and going deeper in Jesus, you'll make both sides angry. But you will be on the true way of following the freedom fighter, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Judgment, uh, pride, defensiveness, too much talking and not enough listening. A lack of repentance, a lack of confession, a lack of listening, a lack of changing. This isn't, that's not going deeper in Jesus. But being quick to listen, being slow to speak, being slow to become angry is going deeper. Confession and lament and humility and empathy, that's going deeper in Jesus. Love and giving oneself for others and maintaining justice and doing what is right, that is going deeper in Jesus. The Apostle Peter, who was there that day at the temple in Mark 12 in our passage today, and who was there that night at the Last Supper in John 13 and 16, he wrote these words in his first letter to the church. He says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Last uh, Sunday in our time, in our service, in our online service, Lindsay and I I just offered some words uh, to our church family. And I wanted to close this morning by repeating something that I said in that statement. As we consider this passage of Scripture and the previous passage in the weeks prior, and again, I believe this is very providential for where we are as a society in today's culture, um, we must learn and we must grow and we must repent on behalf of our brothers and sisters of color and anyone else that has been silenced, minimized, felt forgotten. We must change by the kindness of Jesus. We must repent and change. We must advocate for those who need our voice Because silence and inaction in the face of any racism and any injustice is not where Jesus is going. And we, church family, at Two Rivers Church, we are the freedom people. And we are going with Jesus. And so let's love. Let's love. Let's let the priority be love And we are following Jesus in the way that unconditional and radical inclusivity of the gospel isn't just theology. It isn't just something we talk about. It's actually something that is infused down into our lives and is lived out uh, in action in our lives. Um, let's Let's be that, that kind of people in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our state, in our region, and in our world that we would be about the mission of Jesus, which is freedom and hope and healing for all people to the glory, to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, thank you for the word. And uh, the word is sharp. And it, uh, it, 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 it teaches and it rebukes and it challenges and it changes us if we humble ourselves as we come to the living word. And so I pray that over our church as we um, think about this passage and I desire this passage to renew our minds in the gospel. Uh, Lord, we ask that you lead us, uh, that you uh, show us our blind spots, that you um, show us a renewed sense of our purpose and our mission around freedom and hope and healing and that you would continue to favor our church as we desire to follow you in freeing captives and setting free those who are oppressed. Uh, We we love you and we are grateful uh, 
um, that we are part of this church family and this mission together. Would you continue to send us still others? We want to go and invite still others to join us in this work that you have called us to in your name. Amen. Well, as we sing this last song, I um, encourage you to uh, sing where you are, uh, to receive communion elements where you are. If you're stirred in worship to uh, give and uh, to be a part of this mission in that way, uh, you can send those offerings to our P.O. Box or give online on our website. Let's worship now. Thanks for joining us again, everyone. I uh, want to just let you know we are working hard to create uh, spaces for our church family to connect really throughout the week. 
to be uh, in touch with each other at their comfort level, certainly uh, before we are able to come back uh, and worship as one church family at Colorado Early Colleges. Uh, young adults, that's happening on Monday night. Student ministry on Wednesday night. Women's ministry is happening. Men's ministry is happening. Recreational things are happening. A lot of things are happening. Uh, we also just want you to know that we are going to be beginning uh, some worship and prayer nights at 5 o'clock on Sundays for those who want to come and worship and pray together. If that's something that you are interested in uh, finding out more about, we would love for you to come. Uh, it's on the weekly email. Lindsay's email is on there. You can reach out to one of us and we'll let you know uh, what's happening with that. But have a wonderful day. Uh, by the way, that is tonight at 5. Uh, we are worshiping this Sunday night, June 14th at 5 o'clock. If you're watching this before that time, you're invited to come reach out to us. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day.